Hey friends, welcome back. We're going to continue on in our Bible study through Romans chapter 2. So we left off with Romans 2, 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? So Paul is confronting here the Jew and that judges the Gentile, thinking that they are so much more wicked than themselves. They don't have the law. They're not God's friend. They're not God's favorite. And that somehow God is over gonna, gonna overlook their sins, but uh, not that of the Gentiles. So the Lord is saying, or Paul is saying, uh, don't be deceived by that. And in so doing, they despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So God is being uh, forbearing and long suffering toward them. On, in hopes that men will repent and turn from their wickedness and turn toward the Lord and find mercy and forgiveness. So now we're going to go on to verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render, render to every man according to his deeds. So... Verse 5, we hear the, we see the hardness, after the hardness of their heart, kata, the Greek word kata, means in respect to or, or you act according to the direct tendency of a hard heart in treasuring up wrath. The word hardness is used to denote insensibility of mind. And it properly means what is insensible to the touch or on which no impression is made by contact as a stone. Hence it is applied to the mind to denote a state where no motives make an impression which is insensible to all the appeals made to it. So, you know, I can imagine uh, this being, you know, a hard, very hard, for example, a hard material like granite or um, marble is very hard. Uh, diamonds are considered the hardest substance on the planet. In fact, when they do uh, hardness testing and engineering, they use a diamond-tipped indentor to uh, to go into the material, the softer material, relatively softer material, which it's uh, testing for for hardness. And whatever size indentation is left, they measure that, and then they can determine based on a scale what the hardness is. So. Um, the smaller the indentation made into the material from the diamond-tipped indenter, uh, the harder the material is. So this term, um, what Paul is saying here, after thy hardness, is meant to reflect a mind or a heart that is insensible to God's truth, to God's reason, as would a stone or granite be to an indent indentation. You know, why, why do people get granite on their countertops uh, to prevent indentations so that the surface is hard enough to withstand and be durable enough to withstand many of the uh, impacts that it could take over its lifetime. So Paul is confronting people saying that their hardness of heart and mind keep them back from God's truth, God's spirit, uh, softening it and making an impression in their lives. And then to see some of the verses that go along with this, I want to pull some up here. Matthew, verse, uh, chapter 25, verse 24. And this is the, the story of the various talents, the parable of the talents that are given, that the Lord Jesus uh, conveys in his teaching, that he has, a king has, uh, three servants in this particular case, and uh, one is given ten talents, another is given five talents, talents being a measure of money, a large sum, and uh, and then one is given one talent. And the two with the greater amount of talent, so the, the, the one with the ten and the one with the five, uh, they double their money while the Lord is gone. So their master gives them money and trust, and they're to use that money and uh gain a profit for their master and the master is going to return after a period of time and then he's going to give it these servants have to give an account so this is what this parable is relaying and the the one that had the five talents and the one that had the ten talents uh hold on a second 
So here it is, the the scripture verses, uh, chapter 25 in Matthew 14 through 29. And uh, the one, if you see in verse 21, the one that had the larger amount of talents, one of the, the ten talents, thou has been faithful, the Lord says, because, uh, sorry, I'm kind of uh, intermittent here, but this is the one with five talents. Uh, but the same holds true for the one with ten, that he had gained double his money that was left to him. And the Lord says, Thou hast been faithful only over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And then, in contrast, there's the one with one talent. And he has to give an account. And it says in verse 24 that he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And his Lord answered, it didn't end well with him. His Lord answered, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not where I have not strawed. So this man charges to the Lord that he was a hard man, and uh, that's how he looked at the Lord, a hard man and uh, unmovable, unswayable, um, not able to change the Lord's mind. So this man was afraid of him, and given the gift from his master, he buries it and doesn't use it and doesn't end well for this man of the word hardness in Matthew 19 8 he saith unto them Moses because of the hardness of your hearts suffered you to put away your wives but from the beginning it was not so so this is in reference to the Jews asking him uh, is it right for you to put away your wife for uh, to give her a writing of divorcement and to put her away and Jesus is saying that uh, it, it, Moses allowed it because of the hardness of their hearts. Uh, but from the beginning it was not so. So the, the woman was made for the man and the man for the woman. And when the two became one, they were not to, to put each other away. They were to um, stay in that marriage relationship their whole life. So uh, it was allowed by Moses because of the hardness of their hearts. But especially now in the New Covenant, the Lord does not condone it. So here in Acts 19.9, when Paul, you know, just a little run up to this, Paul was in the synagogue and was speaking boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened, or many of them, or various ones were hardened, and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So Paul is now a converted Christian in Acts 19. He's disputing in the synagogue with the Jews. And some believed and some didn't. They were, they were hardened. Uh, the impression was not being able to be made upon their mind or their hearts. They didn't uh, choose to obey or listen. And uh, then they began to stir up trouble. So the Lord's uh, Paul separated the disciples, those that were believing, um, and uh, but was unable to make an impression on everyone. So you know, someone who remains obstinate and resists the gospel and God's uh, message of mercy and the atonement of Jesus Christ. Uh, is storing up wrath for themselves. They're treasuring up wrath for themselves. They have an impenitent heart, as we see, and um, which is a heart which is not affected with sorrow for sin. They're not mournful. You know, when we say, when Jesus says, blessed are they that mourn over their sin, he doesn't say it exactly in those words, but blessed are they that mourn. You know, mourning brings up the picture of a funeral, someone losing a loved one. Well, that's what happens when a man... Uh, comes to the Lord. You know, Paul says later in Romans that we're to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, know ye not that uh, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So uh, you, the old man is crucified. 
with the Lord. And there's a mourning process. Well, first mourning for your sin, and then, uh, yes, we died to that old man, to that sinful way of life, to our sinful nature, our habit of sinning. And we are raised again in newness of life and become all things are become new in Jesus Christ. And so, you know, these men are impenitent in their heart. We see in Romans 2 5 that the heart which is not affected with the sorrow for sin, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's goodness. And this is an explanation of what he meant by this hardness. And they're treasuring up or to lay up uh, for themselves a in a place of security of property so you may you know consider it a bank vault almost that can be accessed in some future period they're treasuring up this wrath for a future day and you know, hold on a second so this wrath is not immediately put upon the sinner God is not um, directing his wrath towards the sinner right away. It's being stored up. There's some potential energy that's being stored up. And it's not exhausted. It's not meted out in the present time. And hence, because of this fact, the sinner becomes bolder in his sin. But the wrath is for a future use. It is kept in store. We're going to see a verse that relates to that. In Peter, 2 Peter 3, 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the man who or woman who continues in their sin is only storing up in, 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 in increasing this wrath that's going to be meted out to them by every act of transgression. And we see the same sentiment, the same thought pattern is taught. Uh, in a very serious manner in Deuteronomy 32. So I want to go there real quick. This, this is pretty heavy duty. So 32:34 is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. And then we'll just go one more. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. So, you know, here in this verse 35, their foot shall slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand. There's a day of calamity for a person when the person, when God finally says, okay, you've resisted every ounce of mercy Every ounce of long suffering I've put directed towards your life, you will not hear the voice of my spirit. You will not hear the word that I've given in my Bible. You will not listen to the servants who have it upon their lips, the born again Christians who convey the word of God to you. You will not yield your heart. You will not soften. You will not mourn over your sin. Your day of calamity has come, and I'm going to meet out vengeance as a recompense as what's due your life as what's due because of your sin you've been found wanting in the balance and and lacking your scales are unbalanced and now me being a just god me being a just judge i have to mete out the judgment that, 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 that you so beware serious <laughs> Testament here Paul is saying in First Thess Thessalonians chapter two verse fourteen for ye brethren become became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets speaking of the Jews and have persecuted us. And they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So, the wrath is coming upon these men who resist, who kill, kill the Lord Jesus, 
who kill his prophets, who speak against and persecute his name, his, his disciples, and they do this today. You know, we look in this century and how many martyrs there have been, how, how much hatred has been against Christians, whether it's from Islam, whether it's from other religions who kill people for being followers of Jesus Christ. The wrath of God is stored up against these people if they will not repent. First it says, unto thyself, treasure up unto thyself, and it's not for another. So weigh your own heart to be exhausted on thee and not on your fellow man. This is the case with every sinner. Be not deceived by sin. The deceitfulness of sin is thinking you can get away with it. But this wrath is stored up for those who are in their sin and will not uh, repent. In Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth or suppress it or put it down or will not yield to it in unrighteousness. Thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So there is a day of wrath. Fearful statement in Revelation 6.17. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The whole book of Revelation given to John on the Isle of Patmos. And it's the unveiling of, of the Lord when he comes back in as the judge on a white horse with his garments, the blood of his enemies on his garments. And it says, uh, Revelation, because he's going to stamp out his enemies in the winepress of his fury, which is a pretty fearful picture. And it says in Re Revelation 6, 17, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Lord, or friends, when the Lord comes as the judge, that's a fearful day. So his mercy is new day by day. But then when the day of his wrath comes, when he comes to settle account and settle ju uh, judgment upon man, you want to be on the right side, my friend. You want to be covered under the blood and mercy of Jesus Christ and be walking under the shadow of the Almighty. Looking into the Thess Thessalonica church here in First Thess Thessalonians 1.10, an encouragement, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So for the Christian, we are delivered from the wrath to come. We have hope uh, when we walk in fellowship and in the light of God's word and being covered under his precious blood. He in the Gospel of John, John the Baptist, he says, He that believeth on... Sorry, I have to show this verse. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The wrath of God abideth on him. He that believeth not the Son, he that trusteth not in his word and obeyeth, the wrath of God abides on him. Ephesians 5, 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You know, and that's, that's sin, right? It says, um, For this ye know that no whoremonger, the previous verse, For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be, ye, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Be, so don't partake in their same sin, because the wrath of God, the wrath of God uh, comes upon this. And it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as the children of the light. So, much to be said of admonishing us from the wrath of God and fleeing from the wrath that is to come. So, so we know Romans uh, 2 5 also says the revelation and revelation. So, on that day when the righteous judgment of God will be revealed or made known, here, here we learn that the punishment of the wicked will be just. It will not. Um, 
let me just jump back here real quick. It's not just going to be a tyrannical judgment. It's going to be a righteous judgment. And that's a judgment that is right to render or it ought to be rendered. And therefore God will render it because he is just. For he will do what is right. We see Paul say it in First Thess uh, Second Thessalonians 1 6 seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you so the punishment of the wicked is future it's not exhausted in this life it's treasured up for a future day and that day is a day of wrath how contrary to this text are the pretenses of those who maintain that all punishment is executed in this life it's not God is storing it up it's being stored up against those who continue to commit sin God allowing men to keep their free will. Men, you and I are given a free will. We have the right to choose. God doesn't interrupt every decision, every sin we, we commit. He doesn't interrupt your life. But we are storing up and treasuring up wrath for a future day. God, who is the righteous judge, will eventually judge that and do what's right. So find mercy now, my friend. And let's, uh, let's be admonished, as Paul is writing here, that uh, there is a, a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So how foolish it is for the wicked to store up and to treasure up this wrath for the future. And thinking that this inheritance in this world is the only inheritance they're going to have, but there's a future inheritance. And... The ultimate inheritance of the sinner is hell. The ultimate inheritance of the sinner is a lake of fire. And uh, to burn in weeping and gnashing of teeth for eternity, um, be not that man. Be the one who seeks life. Seek the light and the life of Jesus Christ. So let's go on to the next verse. It says, uh, God will render. Who will render? Um, to every man according to his deeds. And render here is will make ret retribution the righteous just judge, give to every man and serves. And we see in this verse to every man, so to each one. And that's what we talked about in the previous verse. This is a general principle. And it is clear that this is uh, in this respect, God will deal with the Jew as he does with the Gentile, as we've been discussing. And uh, that he's going to bring it to bear on the Jew and to show that he cannot escape simply because he is a Jew. So again, we've talked on there is no special privilege for your lineage, no special privilege for uh, your father Abraham or, or Moses being your relative. It's going to be according to his deeds. And this is an important topic here. A uh, You know, a lot of people think that God is somehow going to overlook their deeds. So this is basically as he deserves, or God will be just and will treat every man as he ought to be treated, or according to his character. And the word deeds in the Greek is erga, and it's sometimes applied to external conduct, but it's plain that this is not its meaning here. It denotes everything connected with conduct, including the acts of, of the mind, your motives, the principles, as well as mere external act, uh, a mere external act. So what motivates the act? Not just your outward appearance. And we see that throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament and Old. Our word character more aptly expresses it than any single word. So, if, uh, yeah, that would be your, your deeds define your character. So don't be deceived. It's not true that God will treat people according to their external conduct. But the whole language of the Bible implies that he will judge people according to the whole of their conduct, including their thoughts and principles and motives. And that really is as they deserve. The doctrine of this place is abundantly taught elsewhere in the Bible. So let's look at a few scriptures here. Proverbs 24.12, If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Whoa. So let's not 
plead negligence or ignorance. Ignorance is no pass for the law, especially with the Lord. The Lord is considering it. And he that keepeth the soul, doth he not know it? Does he not know your true intentions? Does he not know every thought and motive behind every action? And shall he not render to every man according to his works? Again, the just principle of the Lord. We reap what we sow. We uh, we get a just um, we get a just judgment for the deeds, the actions that are committed. The erga, Jesus himself in Matthew sixteen twenty seven. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. When the Lord Jesus returns, when the Lord Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives upon his return, and when he begins to establish his kingdom for the millennium of a thousand years, in the beginning of this, he's going to reward every man according to his works. Remember, we went through Matthew 25, and we Jesus discussed the, the parable of the talents. And isn't that the beginning of, of rendering to every man? Rewarding every man according to his works. That's part of it. And not only are the righteous going to be rewarded, as we saw the, men with, the man with ten talents, the man with five talents, who was faithful and a wise servant. He did what was right. The Lord rewarded him and said, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. But the, the wicked servant who hid the talent and, and said, You're a hard man, Master. I knew you were a hard man. And you reap where you haven't sown. Here I buried it, and I'm giving it back to you. Ooh, it didn't end well for him. He was taken out where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. And his talent was given to a faithful servant. And the wicked, who store up wrath for themselves, as we learned in the previous verse in Romans, uh, yeah, they're going to be they're going to be rewarded according to their works, which is going to be uh, hell. And then ultimately, when hell and all creation is cast into a lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is after the millennium, the great white throne judgment, where finally the books are opened, and the book of life is opened, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in those books according to their works. God is a record keeper. God keeps records of our actions. God keeps rec records of those things that we did. And the motives behind those things that we did, were they motivated by faith? Were they motivated by love? Or were they just outward appearance of good actions, but in their heart they were done for selfish motives? Maybe a tax advantage, maybe... They wanted to look good. They wanted to look benevolent when they gave that money, um, you know. But inside, the evil intent of their heart was uh, for another purpose. So God is going to weigh justly. He's going to weigh every action, thought, and intent of the heart. Let's jump back to the Old Testament, Jeremiah thirty-two nineteen. Great in counsel and mighty in work, for thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give every one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Wow. It's, this principle is seen throughout the Bible, my friends. So it's clear that Paul is emphasizing that they're going to be rewarded according to their deeds, according to their actions. I mean, look at Luke 17.10. You know, when we're do, doing that which the Lord has commanded, doing that which is right, the Lord said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, you look in Luke 17.10, so likewise, likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, say to yourself, this is the attitude of heart you should have, not we're some great one, but we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We've only done our duty. We haven't gone above and beyond. We've done which was required of us. And it's not exceptional behavior. It's just uh, expected behavior. And so, um, yeah, doing what is right is expected behavior. Obeying God and not sinning is expected behavior in the kingdom of God. You now, these are kata. These are our deeds. So Christians will not... One, 
Christians will not be saved by these deeds. They're not considered righteous by them, but they're expected as a servant of Christ. And we will be judged on how faithful we were in, in carrying them out. But you can see here in Titus that Christians will be saved on the merits of Jesus Christ, on the merits of our Lord, who, who it says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, but the, so the, the merits of our righteousness will be based on the shed blood of Jesus Christ, but still the rewards of heaven will be according to our works, these, these kata that we're talking about. And that basically means they who have labored the most, who have been the most faithful, shall receive the highest reward on their faithfulness, on their fidelity to the master's service. It shall be the measure or rule according to which he rewards the rewards of heaven shall be distributed. And we see that in Matthew 25, 14 through 29. In these verses here, that in verse 21, where the one servant, and this is said twice, he, uh, he said, uh, let's go back a verse, in verse 20, and he, received five, he that received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. The servant who had done ten also received, uh, received this reward as well. And... So, uh, I, th I made a mistake. I, I, I thought this was ten talents. It's actually five talents, two talents, and one talent. Uh, my mistake. Sorry for that. But these, the ones who had invested the five talents and the two talents were made ruler over many things, and they were allowed to enter into the joy of the Lord. So, you know, there's another parable where, where uh, one was able to rule based on more cities than the other based on the actual amount of profit that he had made so there's a similar parable which we're not getting into right here but your reward the rewards of these people was based on how faithful they were and so is it in the kingdom of heaven so you're not made righteous uh, by you're only made righteous by the blood of Christ but um, your works are going to impact the rewards that are given to a soul in in heaven and in the uh, life to come on the renewed heavens and earth. But also your works can, you know, after having received the Lord, you can bury your talents, you can bury the gifts that the Lord gave you, and you can lose the kingdom. You know, the, the, the servant who buried his talent, uh, the Lord rebukes him and says, Thou wicked and slothful servant, in verse 26, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. So he loses his talent. This one uh, isn't cast into judgment, but he um, he loses his talent. Uh, no, I had to look that up more carefully. I had failed to put verse 30 in there, and it says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant in outer darkness, there it shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he not only lost his talent, he lost his soul. And what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? So here he, uh, out of fear and lack of faith, was willing to bury his talent, the gifts that God had given him, and be an unprofitable servant. Be not that man, my friend. Be not that man. I'm going to render to every man according to his deeds. And uh, so we're going to end it there. Uh, we covered it covered a couple of verses here and the you know we looked in verse 5 remember but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up treasure 
up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So anyway, we're getting through this. We're making our way and uh, being thorough and not to avoid anything. So thanks for sticking in. We'll see you next time.